Throughout the ages in various countries, certain souls come into incarnation who have reached a certain point in evolution where they turn their faces steadfastly from the world toward that mountain of divine light, which some call God. In the resources of worldly pleasure, of human happiness, of popularity, or of power, they find no lasting comfort. They are goaded by the sense of being trapped in a world which offers them no satisfying purpose for living, nor food for the soul. They see that material happiness endures not, power fails, pleasure pals, and they are filled, therefore, with unceasing restlessness of mind and spirit. With constant reiteration, they ponder the great questions. Why and to what end? If these words resonate with you, then do proceed. They are for those who know that personal happiness passes and that personal power often arouses discontent. These words are offered for those who desire earnestly to know the true purpose of life, the reason for human existence upon this planet, something of the plan and the way toward spiritual fulfillment. Yet upon the many crossroads of our planet, its byways and highways travel those who seek the gateway of liberation. In some long past time, the seed of spiritual truth was planted in their hearts, a vision of the gateway which leads to the shining land of atonement, which urged them life after life to seek the reality that lay behind the vision. Perchance they awoke the intuition, or some wise teacher came along that gave them the right knowledge at the right time that led their still human feet to the entrance that leads to divinity, and later rises again, strengthening the need to storm the rocky heights which guard the citadel. Yet, when attained, makes one no longer a son of man, but a son of God. For if the spiritual path is to be found, if the path is to be trod, the vision of the goal recognized, like a lodestar, must rouse in the soul that holy fire, which alone can give the power to achieve liberation.
Before we begin our exploration into the occult wisdom, let us first lay down some of the preliminary concepts or principles that are at the core of these teachings. These must be clearly cognized for one to truly benefit from the ideas put forth in this video. Firstly, the spiritual occultist tries to see the world as it is, composed of energies and forces. In the broadest context, this can be understood as the inner world of spirit and the outer world of form, as well as their mutual interaction or relationship. Within these inner and outer worlds, there is the expression of unity or oneness, just as there is the expression of diversity or multiplicity. It is equally important to discern between the two. Yet, the mind must never get lost in the diversity and always hold in the back of its awareness the underlying connection of all existence. Secondly, we must ever strive to see ourselves as souls, uniting spirit and matter. The evolution of our consciousness coincides with the reincarnation of our soul as it gathers experience upon the physical plane. In each life, we learn certain lessons and develop certain faculties required to progress forward. Yet, what are we progressing toward? The next kingdom of nature. The whole journey of life is marked out by successive points of growth, or initiations, which lead us from one kingdom to the next. And in this order, from the mineral, plant, animal to the human. The goal in the subhuman kingdoms is for consciousness to build its individuality. Once the human stage is reached, we then learn how to break free of our individual consciousness and to enter universal consciousness. It is from this point that the soul liberates itself from the cycle of rebirth in human form. Thirdly, before we achieve this liberation, we must develop our powers of emotion and mind, eventually learning to control the energies that manifest through us. At first, we are unconscious of this process, guided purely by instinct. Yet instinct eventually evolves into intellect, and then intuition. Then we start to become conscious of this process unfolding within us. As we master these energies which link the soul to our personality, we also master the elemental forces of nature, initially just within ourselves, and then beyond our own aura. These elementals are the rudimentary lives which literally shape or build the world based upon the sound produced by the Logos, in the same way that the soul uses sound to build the bodies of our personality. The elementals represent the intelligence within nature itself, not only the intelligence within all life forms, but also within the actual substance of matter. For example, the intelligence which guides the acorn to an oak tree, or which mutates a caterpillar into a butterfly. 
or even the creation of a hurricane. The Earth has within itself great elemental forces which literally create and destroy continents. On a more personal level, our own thoughts and feelings are a type of elemental force within us that we eventually learn to manage and harness. And just as humans have their own evolutionary path, the elementals also have their own evolution parallel with human growth. This coincides with the cycle of involution and evolution. Much of mythology, religion, and folklore is symbolic of these elemental forces and their intrinsic relationship with mankind. In the Western theologies, the higher ranks of these elementals are referred to as angels. And in the Eastern traditions, they are called devas. Whereas many indigenous cultures have referred to them as nature spirits. And because of their intrinsic bond with humans, we often personify our own attributes onto them by giving them human-like features. In reality, they are spheres of light, often oval in shape, and represent the harmony between light, sound, color, and vibration. Their bodies are more etheric, whereas human bodies are more physical. Humans evolve through conscious creative power and mental faculties. The elementals evolve through feeling, through response to vibration and harmony between all life. It is our job to create and control these forces for altruistic purposes. And it is their job to sustain creation by giving proper vitality to the forms we create and nature. In order that humanity might more rapidly break through the thrall of passing pleasures and understand the laws of evolution, the great teachers have again and again spoken the truth, that life of itself is temporary and that no lasting happiness may be found in it. If one really grasps this fact, and ceases to follow the endless desire of personal happiness, then the mind lies open to receive the truth, the purpose of life as seen from the consciousness of the infinite. This truth is envisioned by the great ones from age to age for humanity's guidance when it feels the need arise for illuminating light upon the path.
When the hour comes in which a human soul truly recognizes its bondage and longs for freedom, then the mind opens to receive the light, heretofore shut away by the constant search for material pleasures. Some do not reach this point until the period of material pleasure passes and or old age approaches. Then, as they look back upon their life and upon the past, they wonder what has been gained by this succession of generations, each spending its life caring for and preparing for the next century after century. Nations rise and fall. The progress of civilization is uncertain and often unstable. A cataclysm comes, war, disaster, and the fruits of many years, of many lives, of many nations are swept away. What is the value of this human struggle? What is the purpose? What is the law? When one awakens to a need for knowledge of this inner or spiritual law, when the mind is thus open, then may be given the true understanding of evolution and the final purpose of human incarnation. Herein is the point. It is a high purpose, the gaining of mental stamina through the achievement of independent discernment through the knowledge of good and evil. Once gained, this gives one the power of creative thought, known in the Eastern traditions as Kriya Shakti, or the power of divine creation. On a higher level, this same creative power forms worlds and solar systems, various in kind. At the dawn of the universe is created the union between Purusha and Prakriti, or more commonly known as the marriage between God the Father and Mother Nature. Their interplay brings forth Mahat, or the Divine Mind, and alone has the power to create and is the creative function upon every plane of existence. It is the secrets of this function which we must learn through sex, speech, and thought. To gain one's heritage of conscious divinity and the divine attributes of creative power which follow upon this, we must be immersed in matter cut away from the inner wisdom, from spiritual light, and from the consciousness of God, so that we may unfold vision, perceive light, and the Godhead within ourselves. We must confront evil, which is but the other pole of good, negative and positive, attraction and repulsion, in order that we may know it, so we can control it. For so-called evil is actually involution, a necessary part of all cosmic development, but in the earlier stages, associated with the descent into matter or the assimilation of form. 
that which we know as evil is evil only on the evolutionary arc, when the soul is rising out of matter toward its source to unveil the spirit within. The evolutionary forces represent evil on the involutionary arc, just as the involutionary forces represent evil on the evolutionary arc. In other words, evil is that which is a hindrance to achieving the purpose of the soul at any given point of development. Therefore, the purpose of the involutionary arc is the descent into matter, where the spirit clothes itself in veil after veil of denser forms of matter, eventually the consciousness identifying itself more and more as a separate or isolated unit. In this process, the personality becomes more selfish and self-centered in order to enclose the divine flame within. It is during this period that the law of survival of the fittest must rule, so that the bodies may become powerful and capable of action. As mentioned earlier, this is a cosmic law. But upon our planet, the cycle of involution occurred millions of years ago, as our consciousness passed out of the animal kingdom into the human kingdom. Once accomplished, a human is given their heritage of mind, and the spark of divine ideation, logic, and reason. As we slowly evolve our mind, we evolve the power which shall ultimately give us control of the creative forces of the universe and of our own higher nature. It is from here that we step upon the evolutionary arc, where the new goals of self-sacrifice and unselfishness must be developed and consciously expressed. During the evolutionary arc, the goal becomes for the human to overcome their animal instincts and develop their higher faculties. At this point, early on during the unfoldment of the mind, surrounded by all forces, both good and evil, our path is difficult. We do not know good from evil and therefore we manifest both. The test of our insight will come in the choices we make. It will be proved if we can choose the evolutionary forces, which will carry us upward toward our divinity. If we embrace the involutionary forces, we endanger our heritage, and at the time of ultimate choice, we may choose destruction instead of salvation. It is a long and arduous task, lasting through many eons, as a human is driven by desire, checked by pain, goaded by necessity, slowly awaken from the mental lethargy from our heedless response to impulse. At last, to escape painful conditions around us or to attain our desires, we begin to use our intelligence. Mankind in its early development is by nature lazy, both physically and mentally, and shrinks from protracted thought 
or from the continued action required by a plan which must be carried out. In the beginning of the development of mind, it is not important how a man thinks or what causes him to think. The one essential principle is to develop the faculty of thought. As the greatest virtues the human race knows, power, compassion, and knowledge spring lotus-like from the roots of wrath, lust, and greed, so that the unfoldment of the divine qualities of mind are spurred in its beginning by fear, hatred, and pain. As we evolve, the goads of fear and hate are replaced by others more suited to the evolving spirit. But throughout incarnation, pain remains as the great friend and teacher, refining the subtle bodies, uplifting the soul, guarding us from error and from false paths, and leading us by slow steps to the heights of self-sacrifice, which shall at last make us divine. In our ruthless struggle, only as we remember the need for love can we safely unfold the latent powers of mind from becoming overly destructive. It is within a sheath of love that mental powers must unfold. Hence the work of the spiritual teachers throughout the ages is to show us how we must pass the knowledge we gain from our experiences through the heart, so that wisdom might be garnered. Knowledge separates, whereas wisdom blends. Knowledge tends to be exclusive, wisdom inclusive. At present, men are strongly polarized in the physical and mental more than in the emotional and intuitional, as are women, and thus they supplement one another. In time, men and women will develop complementary aspects on all planes, thus becoming far more useful to one another in the work ahead. Though it's a value to realize as we look back at our succession of prior lives upon this planet, that we have all lived as both man and woman many times, and the path of liberation eventually leads beyond the duality of human form upon the physical plane. Again, the work of the great spiritual teachers is to soften the hardness of our hearts and to keep ever before us in the turmoil of unfolding mental powers the underlying law of unity and love. Firstly, they do this in order to keep the balance of forces. Secondly, they come to mark out the path for those who are ready to step out of human evolution into superhuman or divine liberation and begin the long journey to climb the seven steps which lead to divinity. In every age, for those who seek the path of initiation, few shall find it, and even fewer shall tread it to the end. 
Yet the path remains ever in existence, and the way forward may be found by those who bend the energies of their souls to the task ahead. In ancient parlance, it was sometimes called the Philosopher's Stone. Today the stress of the world is so great that many souls are ceasing to hope that happiness may be found in the experiences of human life. Therefore, they are ready for the reception of the word of purpose in evolution and of the way toward liberation. The five requirements for discipleship are recognition of life's purpose, balancing karmic debt, orientation to the path, study of one's character, balancing the mind by awakening compassion. Discipleship here is someone who is a disciple of their own soul or higher promptings. The first requirement for discipleship is the recognition of the true conditions of worldly life and the determination to seek something better, to use life instead as a stepping stone towards spiritual achievement. This is the so-called awakening, and until this takes place, there is no hope of treading the path. The mind must turn away from the hope of personal happiness here and seek the path of a spiritual life. In passing, one should say that the renunciation of earthly happiness does not destroy it. On the contrary, eventually it brings true happiness as a result of the work on the path. For true satisfaction comes not from gratified personal desires, but from love and service to others. The driving motive of human life must no longer be the search for personal happiness, but the quest for truth. When the disciple sees the world as it is and sees through the illusion of form, this is called the awakening, the first step in discipleship. Form is considered an illusion because it's temporary or based upon impermanence. It is also important to state here that discipleship means someone who is a disciple of their own soul. The second is the beginning of balancing the karmic sheet. You must study the conditions in which you find yourself, determining as clearly as possible what debts you owe and what bonds must be served. One must also strive to live consciously in order not to create any new forms of karmic bondage. To achieve a clear view of your conditions, the mind must be dispassionate, calm, and detached, 
and you must see yourself not as a worldly entity surrounded by people and conditions to whom you owe worldly duties, but as a divine spirit incarnated into the world of causes and effects to achieve certain divine purposes of its own, which seek to aid the greater plan. In order to make more rapid progress, when the balance sheet of karmic debt has been drawn, all things which interfere with the achievement of this purpose must be put aside, or at least achieving a proper sense of one's priorities. There must be no clinging to personal things. In the course of many ages of experience, jewels of the Spirit have been acquired but overlaid many times with dust and rubbish. This rubbish must be cleared away, the jewels polished and cut. The rubbish consists of prejudices, inaccuracies, intolerances, injustices, and personal defects, such as impatience, irritation, disorder, and slovenliness. These must be steadfastly absorbed, leaving the jewels of courage, accuracy, patience, humility, and charity. Therefore, the first requirement for helping others on the path is your own awakening. Once you have envisioned the purpose and the path, you find enough light to help others upon that same path. Then must come the recognition that the path is for all and that the greatest service the disciple renders is the illumination of the path itself since each step upon that path leaves its shining footprints more clearly for others. When suffering cuts into the heart, when the personal self lies in fragments, many doubt the wisdom of the plan, the benevolence of higher powers which bring worlds into manifestation, apparently only to suffer and die. A true understanding of the great plan alone can restore the sanity of faith. At this time in history, where the mind is reaching a relatively high point of development, many teachers are appearing again to show the way of love and the value of human ethics and the necessity for right human relations. The purpose behind each way remains the same, the need of awakening love and compassion at this critical point, when the mind is strong, it shall be guarded by love from destroying the civilization it has built.
The spiritual progress of the world is not only determined by the messengers who come to speak spiritual truths in the outer world. People are far more responsive to spiritual realities in the inner worlds, where they frequently visit during the hours of sleep. There, night after night, participating in classes, they learn many things pertaining to the nature of the self. In sleep, many things which filter through as dim memories or flashes of intuition can become a part of our waking consciousness. Perhaps we have attended one of the great classes or public audiences of the wise ones, where their wisdom and radiance is manifest even to the dullest since their spiritual power is not veiled by the dense sheath of mortal flesh. The work of these classes is carried out by the masters themselves, or by high initiates to direct certain influences in order to awaken the slumbering spark of the Divine Spirit within those who attend. Often, in the outer world, we are directed to that literature or line of work which embodies the teachings we have been receiving on the inner planes, and which we intuitively recognize as truth. Hence the need for mental discernment between truth, partial truth, and falsehood is always a goal at hand. The first class into which the pupil is directed is that which deals with the personality vehicles, the mind, emotions, and body. Training begins with these three. The student is taught to see the world as a training school and that certain faculties must be developed within every vehicle and that each life is simply an opportunity to expand our consciousness. Each incarnation offers new opportunities to carry on the work unfinished or perhaps missed in the last life. If we understand the purpose of incarnation and awaken to our spiritual work or dharma early in life, then much progress can be made. We must know thyself as the true arbiter of our own destiny and recognize that the conditions in which we find ourselves will never improve unless we make them improve. There must be an unswerving steadfastness within the chela to make progress upon the path in order that opportunities are not missed. Certain goals are accomplished and specific lessons are learned. If a strong curiosity of life and its mysteries are not present, then there will be little to swing you into right action.
a human enters the world bound by associations. No human soul is ever wholly free. In every incarnation, the necessity for birth and accepting a family position limits us. Therefore, it is folly to say, I must wait until I am free. One is never free except as one earns and achieves freedom. The power to compel circumstances to yield results marks the beginning of growth. The path of discipleship requires right decisions. One must act, if possible, with the greatest detachment. At best, one sees but a small portion of the path that lies ahead. When the occult student has gained a certain measure of discrimination and adjusted their life with the new insight it gives them, they turn their attention to the specific control of their vehicles. The chela is taught to control all lesser desires since they only act as bonds of limitation or rather desire to attain the goal must draw all other desires into a single flame of purpose and of will. Gradually, he or she must learn indifference to pleasures. This does not mean aestheticism or denial of pleasure but it means gradual indifference as to whether pleasure comes or not. Yet, all self-indulgences must be overcome. Although love in itself is one form of high spirituality, it must not bind. It must pass from personal attachment into more impersonal tenderness, which can even speak the difficult truths which may hurt or anger a loved one if it's in their own best interest. The goal of divinity is indeed a goal of high adventure. We venture to win the unknown, a but dimly envisioned prize. When the spiritual student has consciously chosen the path, they are ready to attempt the perilous ascent. As an explorer prepares by studying the conditions they must face, by learning the language needful, by gaining physical fitness, so too the spiritual pilgrim who seeks the path of liberation, the most dangerous of all adventures, must do likewise. 
for this great task of spiritual achievement requires the utmost expenditure of force in every direction and requires physical, mental, and moral fitness in the highest degree. No explorer who seeks the North Pole can endanger their success by physical indulgence, moral slackness, or mental inefficiency. The price of inefficiency and weakness is death. In the adventure of all adventures, the discovery of godhood, inefficiency leads to despair, and sometimes even madness. Often, the greatest enemy to our spiritual growth is our own personal self, and true compassion cannot be shown to the prejudices and peculiarities of an unworthy instrument. Compassion in its truest sense inflicts discipline upon the personality that it may relinquish its paralyzing grasp upon the soul. Hence, on the evolutionary arc, the grip of matter must be lessened upon the vehicles. That grip which had been so strongly applied during the earlier cycle of involution, millions of years ago. There are two great motives which lead one to the path of spiritual occultism, the search for the hidden truth of the universe, which comes from an eagerness to glimpse the eternal, and the other from a great love for humanity, which leads to the desire for selfless service. In order to help the suffering world, one will offer all that they have and devote themselves to the study of the path and to the achievement of bringing light into the world. This is the path of devotion. It is, of all paths, the safest and surest one, for it lessens the danger of aggregating spiritual power for personal ends, the line of danger, the line of the destructive forces, which endanger the soul's link to the personality. Evil is caused by the evil in our own hearts. We suffer not from the blows of nature, but from the corrupt and evil civilization which we have built. However wisely and skillfully great minds may build civilizations, these civilizations cannot endure so long as corruption in human hearts perverts the wisest of forms to serve their selfish purposes. As humanity becomes spiritually awakened, it will save itself from the suffering which ignorance, selfishness, and indifference have shackled upon the world. Awakening the soul in others becomes of paramount importance as one walks the path, since only through this awakening of souls can true peace and joy come upon the earth.
The work of the Chela on the probationary path, that path which enters the battleground of true self-realization, is guided by various forces, including that of the teacher or guide who gives timely instructions and warnings which bear upon the nature of the test to come and the testing agents who are given freedom by the soul to test the personality. Until the time of probation, there are certain magnetic protections around the personality formed partly by the soul, partly by the great groups of spiritual agents upon the inner planes, who throughout the ages have built great reservoirs of power for this exact purpose. These shells or insulating walls protect the personality vehicles from assaults from the most destructive elementals of nature. This protection, however, ceases to avail if certain conditions are brought about. First, excessive use of drugs or alcohol. Secondly, association with people already obsessed, or shall I say possessed, by these elemental forces, as in insane asylums. The third is the use of certain occult practices which sometimes prematurely awaken the kundalini fire which burns away this protective sheath of the vehicles. Unless exposed to one of these three dangers, under ordinary conditions, a pupil is protected. But when he or she seeks to become a chela, they are of necessity given some of the tests to prove themselves fit and capable of properly controlling occult forces. He or she must prove their power not only to resist attacks upon themselves, but to control the power of these elemental forces. The Chela must know, finally, that all forces, both good and evil, are latent within their own nature. Uncontrolled force falls into vice, yet those forces which gravitate into vice and violence in the early stages are just those which make your evolution possible and which give you control, finally, over nature's more constructive forces. But a chela should not adventure too far upon the path until their virtues are strong enough to sustain them. Otherwise, the increase of power opens the door to the downward way of vice. The path of spiritual occultism is often strewn with wrecks, verily, since too soon or too unprepared many have challenged the destructive forces of nature, which they must eventually conquer in order to tread the path. Beware of seeking to tread the path too soon, lest the forces there awaken within you sleeping devils before you have gained the strength of soul to conquer them. During this period of temptation, all the forces of nature, within you and without, rise up to test your unselfishness. In the history of every great teacher, we find this described through the various metaphors, even the Buddha and the Christ. However great 
the temptations of worldly pleasure may be, they are nothing compared to the temptations and dangers which beset the chela who has challenged the hidden side of nature by seeking conquest on the path of initiation. Therefore, one should be slow to judge too harshly the apparent disastrous failures of occult students who have dared greatly, but unfortunately not too wisely. When exposed to the power of destructive forces, the chela becomes the battleground of Kurukshetra, as described in the Hindu parlance, in which the forces of the personality built through the ages of combat and selfishness on the involutionary arc struggle with the forces of the spirit on the evolutionary arc, which seek to master them. Yet, our full nature must be brought to maturity, cleansed, purified, and set toward service. Forces within your own nature, when uncontrolled, are dangerous, and therefore, in the unevolved human, are left slumbering as long as possible. Yet within the chela, these forces must be roused and set forth so that he or she may learn to control them and therefore eventually gain mastery over them. The force of anger, once mastered, becomes a titan harnessed. Wrath in the uncontrolled man leads to violence, murder, and cruelty, yet it is the source of power, which, when wisely directed, gives man control of destructive forces. The power for passion, which in its earlier stages manifests as sensuality, is the strong root buried in the soil, which, in the later stages, shall flower into divine compassion. Greed, which makes a man gluttonous and selfish, will, in time, develop the energy of intelligence and forethought, which shall bring all nature into subjection. These three great powers eventually liberate the energy wherein you will achieve divinity. In their crude form, they are destructive, but like fire, water, or electricity, when harnessed properly, they prove to be the most dynamic agents for the service of humanity. Not only do outward circumstances bring difficulties into life, which much-needed courage, coolness, and endurance can surmount, but within our own nature awaken demons of destruction, which rise like ghastly specters of an unholy past. We unite within ourselves both the destructive power of demons and the constructive power of angels. When these two are held subservient to our awakening will, pledged to the service of God and to all mankind, we have gained that conquest of self, which makes us 
a master of the wisdom, and the powers of nature are therefore obedient to our own will, which is now aligned perfectly with divine will. You become a master not only by your glorious virtue or by your feats of magic, nor by your powers of vision and intuition, but by your conquest of the elemental forces within your own nature. From the battleground, you emerge triumphant, knowing good from evil, knowing temptation and knowing conquest. You stand steadfast, poised and masterful, directing these forces by your awakened will. When you have learned to wisely direct these forces within yourself, you can likewise direct them in nature. No one can master what they do not understand. And the great atonement of spiritual teachers comes from understanding the sinner's problem. The ability to conquer the forces which others still fail to do and by sharing the strength achieved in past conflicts helps those to arise into assail victoriously, the ancient foe. The tests of the Chela are mostly inner ones. Often when the battle is raging most furiously within, outwardly your life may be calm and untroubled. The forces of the lower self rise up in defiance because while on the path of probation, the light of the soul is now shining brighter than in any prior incarnation. Likewise, its presence is being felt more strongly than ever before. When the light shines brighter, the darkness is illuminated. You must learn to harness this energy in any given moment. Lose yourself in work, not necessarily world-shaking activities of which every young soul dreams, but often the daily drudgery which must be glorified by the spirit in which it is done. Washing dishes becomes a holy exercise when done in a spirit of divine contemplation. The test of the chela is your power to do well, happily and joyously, that task before you, however great or obscure. The hallmark of the true master is spiritual greatness of soul, not of power of mind or success in politics, religion, or science. Not by their powers, mental or occult, do we know them, but by their inner majesty of spirit.